Well, folks, could we just give you all a very warm welcome on a very, very cold night uh, to our prayer meeting, Bible study, and we're glad to see you. And uh, lovely to see the boys and girls coming in as well. I know that some of those uh, estates and developments are, the roads are very slippy and they haven't been gridded. And uh, we're able to get the bus out and parents were able to bring their children. And it's always a joy to see uh, boys and girls in the house of the Lord. And also to welcome those who are joining with us in the building and also those who are tuning in to the live stream. And wherever you are, we want to warmly welcome you. Trust the Lord will bless and encourage all of our hearts this evening. 440, we'll stand together as we sing. 440, teach me thy way, O Lord, teach me thy way. <coughs> Let's all stand as we sing. We'll bow briefly in prayer. Loving Father, we thank thee once again for the return of our prayer meeting. We rejoice, Lord, uh, that thy word declares so often, Lord, that we are uh, to be found in the place of prayer. We are to seek thy face. Lord, we thank thee for the multiplicity of commands that are found in Scripture, Lord, concerning the matter of prayer. And we bless thee, Lord, that it is, Lord, a command to be obeyed and Lord we know that men ought always to pray and not to faint and Lord we know that we are to pray without ceasing and Lord how often thou hast said seek ye my face and Lord we think of those timely words given to the disciples in the garden of Gethsemane when thou did say to them watch and pray lest ye enter into temptation the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak and Lord, we confess that uh, whenever we cease to pray, Lord, when we don't pray the way we should, when we don't meet with thee, we give, Lord, place to the devil. Lord, we allow the flesh and its ugly head to be seen. We think, Lord, of how on that mount when Moses' arms were held up, Lord, by Aaron and Hur, uh, Joshua prevailed against Amalek in the valley. And when those hands, Lord, were lowered, Lord, and became heavy, then Amalek prevailed. And Lord, we believe not only historically, Lord, of that event, but the spiritual meaning. Lord, we need to continually lift up holy hands to God. We need, Lord, to have the rod of God in our hand that we might reach to heaven and call upon the Lord and grasp help and power from God upon earth, that we might see Amalek defeated, that we might see the enemy, Lord, pushed back, that we might see, O oh God, our sins destroyed, that we might, Lord, 
Lord, live in victory, Lord, and have, Lord, the conquering spirit, Lord, just as Joshua had. But, Lord, we know that it was a difficult work, Lord, climbing that mountain. And then, Lord, having to take the stone to sit Moses upon. And then each man having to take his arms and hold them up. And Lord, they were steady. And we bless thee, Lord, that the steady hands of prayer will defeat any Amalek, any devil, Lord, inspired enemy. Lord, even the old flesh itself, the pull of this world, Lord, the temptation, the idle spirit, Lord, the natural tendencies to laziness within us. We praise thee, Lord, that the victory is there for, our, for us to take, for we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We thank thee that Christ and his finished work has dealt with our sin. And our sins should not have dominion over us. And they should not prevail against us. Because Christ has broken the power of cancelled sin. He set the prisoner free. And his blood avails for sinful men. His blood avails for me. And we thank thee for the victory of Calvary. It was there that every enemy was brought to the very heel of the Saviour. We bless thee, Lord, their head was crushed. We thank thee that Christ is victor. And he rose victorious or Lord, the grave. We thank thee that he has conquered sin and death and eternal hell for us. And every power of the enemy has been smashed. We thank thee we are led in triumph in Christ. And there is overcoming power. There is grace sufficient. There's mercy reserved. We bless thee, Lord, that there is the promise now, not only of a risen Saviour, but of the one he sent, the Comforter. And we praise thee for the power of the Spirit. We rejoice we don't have to, Lord, labour in the energies of the flesh. We don't have to, Lord, wrestle, Lord, and be defeated. But we thank thee, Lord, that we can stand in the victory and we can be filled with the Spirit. And thou hast told us in thy word that if we walk in the Spirit, then we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Be with us here tonight in this prayer house. We pray, Lord, for the preparation of heart. We ask for the cleansing of the blood of Christ. Lord, we repent of our sins. Lord, we repent of our wickedness. We confess our lack of love for thee and for our fellow man. And we know there are many today who make an excuse for sin. And Lord, it doesn't have to be put right. It's just a little flaw. It's just some blemish they have. Lord, it's just a little fault that they have. But Lord, then, if they deal with it like that, they never need to repent. But Lord, we recognize that our sin is against a holy God and we must repent of our sins. We we must acknowledge them. Lord, they're not something that we get a wrap over the knuckles for. We realize, Lord, that our sins are damning. Lord, they would destroy the soul and body in hell. Just one single transgression. That's all Adam was guilty of. And it shut him out from thy presence and made him a child of the devil. And Lord, he was bound for hell. Only you searched him out in the garden and you saved him by sovereign grace. And we praise thee, Father, for the cleansing power of the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that now makes me white as snow. No other fount I know nor need. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we thank thee there is a wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And now to my heart is the blood applied, glory to thy name. And the vessels cleansed by blood, pardoned and forgiven. We pray, Lord, thou wouldst put thy spirit upon and grant that we might be filled with the spirit. Whether we stand behind this sacred desk or we sit here in the room in the chair, and we are meeting with thee around thy feet and thy word. We're to gather later on for prayer. We pray for thy presence to be a felt reality. Bless those who are listening online. We pray that thou wouldst be with them as well. Encourage their hearts. Bless them in their own soul. And Lord, grant that even though they can't be present in the building, that they will get the blessing, that they will be ministered to, that they will be spoken to, that they will hear the voice of the Lord through the word. And you'll encourage us all this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the 
mustard seed children's meeting thank thee for the workers and the boys and girls and young people who come in we thank thee lord for thy word that has gone forth among the young and we rejoice at this year already lord that has been working you're bringing unsaved in you're bringing boys and girls back lord you're encouraging us in so many ways we thank thee for sunday and that uh, lord sunday night meeting and the young people we thank thee for the young adults and the many you brought in to the hall we bless thee lord for the hall so filled lord packed lord was seats out and we thank thee for that we bless thee for young people in the house of god on the lord's day evening some of them lord been to their third even fourth service and yet there they were in the house of the lord and we bless thee O god for thy word we thank thee for our brother callum and for the faithful message he brought to the young adults and we pray you will bless and encourage him in his own heart we pray for our young people we pray lord you will call them out to full-time service we pray lord you'll single them out as you've done before in this house lord you've called young people lord to ministry we pray lord you will call uh, young people to be missionaries to be ministers lord you will prepare them in the church lord if they're not into full-time work uh, for office whether in the eldership or the diaconate we pray lord that you will lead them on with thyself as they plan their future grant that you'll be with them and not to bless and loving father keep thy loving arms around us as a church family encourage our hearts in these days when the devil is so busy we grant lord that you will protect the work and keep thy hand upon it as we commit our way now to thee so bless and be with us and encourage us lord we pray for we offer this our prayer with thanksgiving in our saviour's precious and worthy name amen, amen. we'll turn in our bibles just for a bible reading uh, second peter and the chapter one second peter and the chapter one Second Peter and the chapter 1, what I intend to do tonight is to give you a little summary and a little flavour of the minister's week of prayer and uh, I just want to take you through some of the uh, messages that we heard and I just want to read this chapter in connection with those messages. Verse 5 of first, Second Peter, sorry, Second Peter chapter 1 and the verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. That wasn't a text, by the way, for the ministers. Make uh, your calling and election sure. Uh, I think if we haven't got it this far, then it's a bit too late. Verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, or right, or proper. I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Amen. We'll end our reading there. Uh, in fact, we'll not, sorry, I meant to read it, verse 15, sorry. Verse 14. Knowing sh that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me, moreover, I will endeavour that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Amen. Uh, in verse 12, uh, Peter says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Now notice what he says, Though ye know them, and even be established in the present truth. Paul, uh, Peter says, verse 13, Yea, I think it meet, I think it's right and proper for me, as long as I am in this tabernacle, in this body, 
to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And then verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. And uh, when we came to the week of prayer, uh, I want to tell you that there were many things that were taught to us when we were young believers. And uh, a lot of the ministers who came, they simply put us in remembrance, just as Peter did. In fact, he said he was a, a good servant of the Lord when he puts you in remembrance. And even though you know these things, uh, Peter says, as long as I am in this tabernacle, I think it's right and proper to keep these things before you because we are creatures who can easily forget. And whenever I was at the week of prayer, ministers, they do preach pretty quick. And I don't have shorthand. Some of you young people wouldn't know what that was, but anyway. And I don't have a little recorder. There are people who can sit on their iPad or whatever it is, and they can literally look at the preacher and they do this. Uh, there was one man, I had him as my assistant, and he was a student, and he was in my house, and I was talking to him about principles, about the Lord's work, and he was going like this, looking at me. And I stopped, and he asked me, you're bluffing me, aren't you? You're just sitting there doing that there. There's no way you're, you're doing that, taking this in at the speed that I'm talking and you're letting on your typing. Stop ye bluffing. And he showed me. He had it word for word. Now, I'm telling you, there's fast typers and he was one. And there's men who can do it. And then some have the gadgets now where they have the pen and whenever you write on the screen, it puts it in the text. I don't have that. I decided it would bring to the week of prayer, big mistake, one of the finest pointed pens you could get. One of them gel ones, some, some of them you lift and you near rub it. And I'm just realising, well I've gone over it a few times tonight and today, but I'm just realising I wrote it all in joint writing as well and I can hardly see it <laughs> as a fact. I can hardly see it and uh, I didn't get a chance to highlight everything, uh, but quite a lot of it's still fresh with me. So I'm going to have to keep the glasses on and uh, enable me just to have a look at some of these things. There was a, a theme that uh, did present itself during the week of prayer, and that was to do with preaching. And you would imagine that when you're among preachers and the subject of your preaching, the content and so on. But there were many things practical and devotional and some uh, doctrinal. But uh, it's the customary for the present moderator to start the week of prayer. So that was the Reverend Samuel Murray. And he took the theme of unity and um, he spoke from the heart, that's for sure, and he brought us to Genesis 13. The opening message really was to do with Abraham and Lot, and uh, it was to do with the strife that they had between the herd men of Lot and the herd men of Abraham. And uh, he took us through that uh, very gently, and he highlighted for us, uh, first of all, the cause of strife. And the cause of that strife was that uh, they were grow, growing themselves, outgrowing themselves in the land and there was a need for water and Lot's herd men were taking over a certain place and Abraham's herd men needed that and they lay claim to the land and uh, it just showed us that it was strife among brethren and the cause of the strife really shouldn't have been there because Abraham said to Lot and to the herdsmen of Lot, we be brethren and of course there was a great emphasis on the fact that unity was needed among ministers and our presbytery. And uh, there probably are matters that are ongoing in presbytery, things that are being looked at, and there was certainly a call for unity. It's not to say we're deeply divided, we're not. It's not to say that there's one half believing this, another, no, we're not. But there are issues there that can be divisive, and uh, it was just a timely reminder that we be brethren. And then he spoke about the calamity and the strife because the enemy was in the land, the parasite, and they were watching. And they could see the contention. And here are people who God has called out of the earth of the Chaldees. God has blessed Abraham. Everybody knows that he's a man of God. And if you can imagine what the, the ungodly would be doing if the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham began to fight. And we don't mean just strife. It would have literally become a battle and they would have killed each other. Well, the enemy would have waited. And then whenever they finished and they were tired and whoever was left, they would go in and destroy. And so there would be strength in unity, uh, but there would be calamity. And they dealt with that at the end, or the second point, the calamity. The enemy in the <coughs> land, and if they were to fall out, the enemy would just pounce. 
and uh, certainly would have no strength. So he did speak, and he emphasised we be brethren. There's a lot he said, and the spirit of solidarity must be maintained in all division and strife put away. He reminded us of what happened at Corinth and how Paul had to deal with such strife and division. It's the most divided church in the New Testament is the church at Corinth. And then he spoke about the cure for strife, which was humility. Abraham actually owned the land. It was given to him. Lot didn't own anything. In fact, Abraham could have said to Lot, get you back to Ur of the Chaldees, because God hasn't called you. You just came with me. He's called me, and he has given me the land, and he has given my seed the land. And therefore, he was the father of the nation. And Abraham could have said easily to Lot, uh, that he has no right to the land and we'll take everything we need for our cattle but he didn't in order to avoid strife and it's the hardest thing to do he took the lowly position and he was humble and he said to Lot the land's before you even though it was his by right he didn't claim his rights and he denied himself right in order that he might avoid strife and he says, you go to the right hand, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left hand, I'll go to the right. He just trusted the Lord. And he didn't demand his right. And that cured the strife. And, you know, any strife can be easily cured with humility. That's a fact. Every trouble in the church, by the way, that's a fact, could be easily cured with humility. And what keeps it going and what keeps it spreading is pride. Pride. And sometimes, we're not talking about big issues, but sometimes it's better just to bite your tongue or just give up your right and just leave it with the Lord. So it was a timely message and uh, it encouraged us to strive for unity. It was also an opportunity for the younger men when we came to Tuesday. Uh, there are two preachers every day except Monday and Friday. We have the half days of prayer. Um, well, it's a little longer, but it's... Uh, basically the half days of prayer but Monday Monday or Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday you have two preachers and uh, it's the moderator who picks the preachers and destroys their Christmas dinner and their enjoyment of Christmas when he phones them up and tells them you're preaching uh, so he had chosen some of the younger men and it's a daunting task I can tell you uh, there's one of our senior men and he was preaching and you could hear his voice that he was nervous it's hard to believe it's hard to believe. I remember one time I was in the minister's room. I'm digressing, I shouldn't. I was in the minister's room in Lisburn and Dr. Douglas was there and he was a nervous wreck. And I'm telling you, it's hard to believe. One of the most confident men I've ever met in my life. No. He said to me years ago, he says he used to look out through the little keyhole to see who was in. <laughs> and he saw that on Sunday nights there was very few people in and he went to pieces. I remember one time he came in and he said to me, I quote, he says, I don't know what I'm going to preach. And I went, I literally went like this, well, you're a bit late now because the service is about to start because we're about to have a two-minute prayer and into the pulpit. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to say. I have nothing. And I'm going, what? He is nothing. Well, I have nothing with nothing. Yeah, absolutely nothing. And he got into the pulpit and he preached a message that I never heard the like of in my life. I said to him afterward, what were you panicking about? Oh, the Lord gave me help. That's what he said. The Lord, well, only he knows that. But it's a daunting task and we were praying hard for these young men. And uh, we had the Reverend Stephen Nelson and he came along. Stephen's over in Risharkin, the son of Reverend Timothy Nelson. And a uh, very capable minister, I have to say that. And he ministered with unusual liberty and power. And he spoke from the heart. Powerful, powerful. It's very like a personal message. And he spoke from number 16. And he spoke about the Levites and how God had called them and separated them, and they were to minister in the temple. Uh, and he spoke about us being separated unto the Lord, to stand before the Lord and before the people and to serve them. But he did deal with one issue, which was very, very good. And he spoke about Korah. And he says, in that calling of God, there was Korah and many of his followers. And they were not content in the place that the Lord had called them to. And they began to contend and Moses even said to them, is it a small thing with you that God has given you this work to do? Is it so small and insignificant that you feel 
that you're better and you want a better position. And I have to say, for a young man coming to senior men, I suppose I put myself in there, but we're not talking by senior by way of experience or theology, but senior because you're in the ministry a long time. But he, he did say, he says, you know, men, it's important to uh, not even desire the position of other men. And maybe you feel that your little place is small, and but God has called you to it. It's a privilege to serve the Lord there. He brought it out beautifully, spoke from the heart. And he says, maybe you would like a call elsewhere. Maybe you would like somebody's bigger church, and maybe you'd like a lot more people in the meetings. And so he really brought it out beautifully. And then he just said that the sons of Korah, uh, they rebelled against the Lord. They were not content with what God had called them to and the place he had given them. Uh, and he just exhorted us and he told us, look, it's a privilege to be in the service of God. And if he places you wherever you are, then you accept that and serve the Lord there. And whatever it is he calls you to, whatever people that they are that he calls you to, you love them and you serve them and you minister to them because just as the Levites, they were to minister and to stand before the Lord because they were separated and called and you're not to scorn the place and position the Lord has given to you. Uh, I'm remembering these notes, by the way, because I'm hardly seeing them. Uh, on Tuesday afternoon, uh, the Reverend Ran McKee, it was his opportunity to come, and uh, Ran opened his heart to us in a very personal way. And uh, I always feel that there comes a point in the week of prayer when uh, we as ministers have to cease from repenting. And it happened many years ago. It was a Wednesday afternoon. And from Monday right through to Wednesday, ministers were lamenting their backsliding and their sins. And, and they were telling the Lord how they had failed him. This was going on from Monday afternoon right through to Wednesday afternoon. So it was a bit dour, that's all I can say. And Dr. Paisley stopped the meeting. Never forget it. And he says, gentlemen, gentlemen, it's now time we accept forgiveness from God and start praising him. Well, that whole week of prayer completely changed and it hinged on that. Well, I, that happened early because the Reverend Ryan McKee came in and uh, ministers have to repent and look and reflect on the last year because you're meeting in the same place with God a year later and there has to be thanksgiving, but there has to be uh, repentance. And then he brought us to Psalm 138 and he took up the theme of praise and rejoicing and uh, give us the reasons from the psalm, very devotional, and it was personal to him as well. God answers prayer. God strengthens us. These are reasons for praise. God cares for his people and loves us. And he protects us. And then he revives us. And he also perfects that which concerns us. And then we had another senior man, the Reverend Ian Harris. Ian has a very conversational approach. Uh, he's never loud. He doesn't shout. And the microphone needs to be turned up. And he just chats to you and ministers the word very sincerely. But he took a beautiful theme from uh, the life of King Josiah, the godly King Josiah. And uh, he spoke about one of the characteristics of Josiah. There's many characteristics because at 16, we believe he was saved about eight years of age, if you follow scripture. At that stage at eight, uh, when he became king, he, he sought after the Lord as God. So that was the beginning. And we believe that's when he was saved. When he was 16, they highlighted some of the things he did. He had uh, reformation and renewal. Uh, but there was something that was said because when they were clearing out the temple and they were taking out all the rubbish and they were bringing in the instruments and all the holy things of God to establish the worship of God. And as they were clearing out the temple, the book of God was found, the law. And they came to Josiah and he gathered the people together and he had the law of God read. And when they heard the law of God, they realized that both I and my fathers have sinned. And he ripped his royal garments and the Bible tells us that he uh, had sent to the, the prophetess uh, Hulda and she came and she brought word from God. And she says, yes, Israel has sinned and they've sinned grievously. Uh, and those laws that they had broken and that curse that follows uh, will be exacted upon the people. And Josiah lamented and he mourned and he rent his garment. And the Bible says that God spurred Josiah and his people. And here's why. It says, because, and this is what God says of Josiah, because thou hast a tender heart. And he preached on the tender heart. 
I couldn't replicate that message. I don't think I could even convey to you the sentiments of it. It probably was for me one of those messages I will never, ever forget hearing. Uh, I can recall, I have the outline here of most of the notes, but to get the actual sentiment and the power of God and the way it was presented to us and the manner in which it was presented and the sincerity and humility and yet with authority, uh, I'll never forget that message. Uh, and I had prayed on the Monday. I prayed on the Monday publicly that God would give me a tender heart. I actually prayed that. And then on Wednesday uh, in the morning, he preached on the tender heart. Uh, and what a message. And uh, he spoke about all that Josiah did. I, I could go over the message, but I just wanted to give you a flavour of other men as well. Uh, but uh, I have no doubt that that certainly was a message that resonated with me. And uh, that's what we need in the ministry. We don't need a hard heart. And we don't need a heart that has no compassion. And we don't need a heart that is feeling it's full of pride and better than someone else. And uh, it's the tender heart we need, a very tender heart. And sadly, I didn't say this, but it is missing in Christendom. And uh, it's very much needed in the work of God. They say that the Christian army is the only army that buries its wounded. And how true that is. Uh, it buries its wounded. It doesn't care for the fallen at times. And uh, it doesn't really care for one another. And if someone falls, then they either kick them when they're down or they bury them. Or like the good Samaritan, they don't, or like the priest and the Levite, instead of the good Samaritan, they walk on the other side. But a tender heart in the work of God. And dealing with people and problems. And yet at the same time, having to deal with your own heart's problems, your family problems. And then maintaining a tender heart. And I just brought out aspects in the life of Josiah, how he was able to maintain a tender heart and seeking after God and renewal and, and putting the Lord's work first. And when those things were done, then God gives the tender heart to do the work. Uh, it was a very, very encouraging word. And then we had uh, one of our own, we'll call him, uh, the Reverend Julian Patterson. Uh, Julian came and there didn't seem to be a single nerve in his body. Uh, I don't know what happened to me. He certainly didn't. It's probably he was said he was shaking, but it didn't come across. He came across as a man, I feel. <laughs> and if this is uploaded, I don't think it will be, and he hears it, but he looked like a man he has done every conference and every fundamental reform conference the world has ever seen. For he came just, I just felt he came with, with confidence. So I just feel he got a message from God, and uh, he was just sure it was from the Lord, and the Lord had filled him with his spirit. So he reminded us of conflict, and... Uh, he, he took us to uh, Luke 22 and to Peter and how uh, Satan had desired to have him, to sift him as wheat. And he spoke about the devil as our enemy and how he targets those who are in leadership. And uh, he didn't say this, but I thought of it during it and I thought to myself, do you know whenever you see the Western movies, and, and I tell you the movie could be over in the first two minutes if they actually did this, but they don't do it to the very end. If you kill the chief, the Indian chief, all the Indians stop fighting, they all go home. Well, that's a fact. You ever see Westerns? All the old Westerns, you watch it. And if they killed the chief in the first five minutes, you wouldn't have an hour of a movie. So they leave it to the end. And I thought to myself, you know, they take out the, the, the leader. That's what Israel did recently, taking out the leader. And that's what Julian was bringing out. Peter was the, the leader of the pack. He was the one to the fore. Uh, and the devil, uh, he attacked Peter. And if the devil could bring Peter down, every other disciple and apostle uh, would fear. Uh, and even those who were followers, Peter, the one who's the leader, the one who's to the fore, Peter, who Paul called the pillar in the church. And uh, we know that Peter was the one that gave the lead, was to the fore, I would believe that it was Peter who slew or took the ear off the high priest's servant uh, with the sword. And we know that Peter was the one that boasted the most. And he said to the Lord, Lord, deny you. <laughs> Lord, I would die for you. I would die for you. And uh, he highlighted then the plight of Peter. And then he spoke <coughs> about Satan desiring him. He brought it out beautifully how God gave permission. And then what he wanted to do to Peter he wanted to sift him as wheat and it taught us about shaking of the, the wheat from the corn and then separating you between you and God. And then he dealt with the prayer for Peter. The Lord says, I have prayed for thee. 
And when thou art converted, brought it out from the Greek that the word doesn't mean saved, it means restored. When you're restored again to first love, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And then uh, there was the progression of Peter, uh, when thou art converted, strengthen. And we know that he went on to preach, and he was renewed again, and he went on to give us two of those great epistles. So it was a timely reminder that ministers are their targets for the devil, and he wants to take us out and destroy us, and therefore we are to be sober and vigilant, because your adversary is a roaring lion, walking about, seeketh whom he may devour. The Reverend Glenn Wilkerson, I'm not sure if you've heard him preach or you know of him, he's a minister presently in Londonderry. He's only there a number of years, and Glenn came. It's a daunting task, I tell you, for men who just left college, and some of these men are still, I think, under a senior minister, and some are just outside of it, of the three-year rule. And uh, he came, and he dealt with a very uh, familiar theme, and that was Christ and him crucified. I feel this is where a lot of the message to the end of the, of the week all blended in. They really blended in as one single message, and that was the content of our preaching. And to deal with preaching in a day of charismatic confusion, and a day of ecumenism, and a day of drama and puppeteering, a day of dance band music, a day of change, a day where you can do anything to try and get anyone in, and it generally works, but they don't stay, and you don't feed them, and you don't make disciples of them. And there was an exhortation, I feel, a timely one, from the rest of the men who preached, a real timely message, just, just step upon step, doctrine upon doctrine, and we got a great edifice of truth uh, through these preaching from Thursday through to Friday, these three men. So Glenn Wilkerson preached from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and uh, he preached about the gospel, how Paul came to Corinth. And Paul didn't come in the enticing words of man's wisdom. Uh, the presentation he used was the gospel. He didn't come in the power of the flesh. He didn't come with newfangled ideas. He didn't come with fancy things. He just came with preaching. That's all he did. And Paul planted the church in Corinth. We know that he got the Macedonian call. We know that. But he just came preaching the word of God. And as a result of that, the church was established in Corinth and Paul established many other churches just through preaching and nothing else. And the presentation he used was the gospel, the <coughs> message, Christ and him crucified. In fact, he said to the church at Corinth, he determined when he got there to know nothing among you but Christ and him <coughs> crucified. And that's the priority that he gave to his ministry to preach Christ and him crucified. And he exhorted us as a denomination to stand upon that principle. Many of our churches have the text behind the pulpit. Uh, Christ, uh, we preach Christ and Christ <coughs> crucified. And how true that is. And we want to maintain that standard. Central to Paul's message was an uplifted and an exalted saviour. And glorifying the person and work of Christ. And then he spoke about the minister's uh, personal weakness. Uh, Paul said he came to Corinth in fear and trembling and he came on his own. It was a huge city and Paul came to that city uh, in fear and trembling. He had received the Macedonian call in a vision in the night. A man stood and said, come over and help us. And they uh, ascertained the mind of God through that and they, uh, with full assurance, <coughs> headed off to Corinth. But Paul <coughs> entered Corinth on his own. And he was in fear and trembling. And he preached the word, not knowing what would happen to him, but just knowing assuredly God had called him. And he used the same method that the church has used for years, and that is, and to this day, the preaching of the gospel. But there are big changes mm -hmm. uh, coming in Christendom and various churches. And uh, we as a church need to be careful uh, that we preach the same message, Christ and him crucified. And then there was that powerful assurance because the Lord stood with him. And he preached, and their faith stood. That's what he said. Their faith stood in the power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. The Reverend Ian Kenny, I put him in the senior bracket, just for, for senior sake. And uh, he came, and uh, it's an amazing thing because John Greer was sitting in front of me. And when Ian was, was preaching, I thought John was a wee bit agitated. That's all I'm saying. But here's the reason. Ian Kenny had actually taken his text. He was to preach on the last day on Friday. 
And Ian Kenny, now if I if I was tell you the text, you wouldn't believe it's in John eight, John fourteen, and it's thirty verses thirty and thirty one. I didn't even know it was there. It's an obscure text, and how those two men arrived at that te- those two verses, I do not know to this day. It's nearly an impossibility. I don't think. In a million goes, if you open the Bible at the same time, even in the New Testament, you'd even ever come up with those two verses. And uh, it was just the Lord saying to his disciples in the upper room, you know, that he had obeyed the commandment of the Father. And then those little words, arise. Knowing that he was going to the cross, he said to his disciples, arise, let us go hence. And he took those words and he preached on Christ going to the cross. And... uh, brought us to the thought of how Christ anticipated that cross. He knew. He knew what was coming. And yet he still said, Arise, let us go. Knowing what he was going to. Uh, tremendous example. Uh, Christ, to follow Christ. And then he spoke of the acceptance of the cross where Christ says, I have obeyed the commandment of my Father. I have come and I will finish the work. And then there was the advancement to the cross when he says, Arise, let us go knowing what he was going to when he left the upper room. And then there was the application, take up thy cross, follow me, and to uh, bear all things for the Lord, and uh, to go the way of the cross, and to die to sin and self, and to put the old life to uh, crucifixion and mortification in order that we might follow him. Very, very encouraging word. But that meant that John Greer had no message. And by the way, this was the Thursday afternoon when he took that word. So John Greer, providentially, uh, was travelling all week from Balamina to the week of prayer. And generally he stays, but he didn't stay this time. And he travelled, so he was able to go home. And he prayed, and he had a message to get ready and prepared, although he probably has thousands of them, but to settle on it. And he had to go home that night. And he came the next day. And then he told us, he says that, uh, although we, I, I was going to say, I, I was going to say there, I shared a cell with him there, but I shared a room with him during the week of prayer, as I have done for the last 30 years. And he said to me, John, John Greer, I took on John Greer's text. Well, Ian had a bereavement, and he had to go home a couple of times during the, the prayer times, and there was sickness, and then the person passed away. And uh, I says to Ian, when the person passed away, it may be better for you, Ian, if you swapped with John Greer. And then you do the Friday morning, he could do the Thursday evening. That would free you up and you could go home, meet the family, and then you could come back and preach the message on on uh, Friday morning. Now, aren't you glad he never took my advice? <laughs> he had to come back on Friday morning and uh, the text was gone. I thought of that verse in scripture where the Lord says, all that ever went before me were thieves and robbers. <laughs> so they took his text. But John Greer came and uh, he came with a powerful message from Acts chapter 26. And again, it really was the power of the gospel. And he dealt with it in a wonderful way in the life of Agrippa and the effect that the, 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 the gospel had. And then he gave us some powerful reasons why, why we should preach the gospel. He really made an appeal to the ministers in the free church that they should be preaching the gospel. It's not that they weren't. It's a timely reminder. Remember what Peter says, even though you know these things and they're present with you now, it's good for me to put you in remembrance of these things, lest you forget, lest you get sidetracked, lest you change your way of going, lest you introduce something else. And then he brought out from that preaching of Paul to Agrippa, To believers, never mind in the gospel, the power of the gospel. And uh, he brought out uh, really that the gospel is sufficient of itself. It doesn't need anything else. It's the power of God unto salvation. And not only that, he spoke about the gospel as the only thing that can reverse uh, the effects of sin. The gospel. That's why we must preach it. And he contended uh, for the preaching of the gospel on our Sunday night services. And to get the gospel out and uh, to preach that gospel. And uh, he also then spoke about, in the the last requirement, that God requires repentance uh, from sin in the gospel. And he brought out, and I felt, I was shouting amen to it, by the way. I don't know how many others were, but I certainly was. He brought about uh, the responsibility of men to repent. And repentance doesn't save us. Uh, God, Christ has done that on the cross. 
But he did say man's responsible. When they hear the gospel, they're responsible. And we need to point that out to sinners. That they just can't sit and say, well, I'm passive. They're not. And even though we know the will is disabled by sin and defiled and incapable of it, yet they're still responsible. And I just feel that that's a, a really a massive blow to hyper-Calvinism that for many years has tried to infiltrate the free church and tried to destroy the free offer of the gospel. Uh, we stand on the free offer of the gospel and he was emphasising God's sovereignty, the gospel, preach it, but man's responsibility, apply the word, make men feel they're responsible. They leave that meeting, uh, you, you have cleared your hands and, and it's up to them. Even though we know they're disabled by sin, even though we know uh, that they cannot repent, they cannot believe, they cannot come to Christ, God still holds them responsible. And when a God commands a man to repent, it's not that man's passive, he's not. Man, because of his sin, refuses to, rejects naturally the gospel. But preach it, and preach it with the power of God. This is just the sentiments of the messages we received, and it was a blessed time. And then we had seasons for prayer. I didn't bring the list with me, but every day we have uh, different days and afternoons set aside for prayer. Uh, we go around all the six counties, and we take in every single county. And uh, Monday was Cumber, by the way, County Down. Uh, quite a lot of churches, by the way, in County Down. So being Cumber, I always, I always feel, well, if your church is in there, that's the day you should be praying. Should you never pray another day? So I was able to pray, and I got a real blessing. And then from that, uh, I was able to seek the Lord. I didn't bring uh, the big sheets with me with all your names on it, by the way. And, uh, but I did pray through that list and prayed for you all. I don't, don't mean this, I missed nobody on the list. And then there were matters I brought to the Lord. But we prayed for every minister, every church, every work, every commission, committee, and every uh, member of presbytery, and every board. Uh, they let the Bible speak, the missionary uh, council, uh, the home missions, uh, missionaries, and the foreign missionaries, the new missionaries going out to Kenya, Uganda, and those who are already on the field, and those who are retiring from the field, are retired ministers, every single one of them by name. And then there's a few individuals added to the list, like Stephen Hamilton and uh, Kevin McLeod, who has taken another bleed in the brain, but thankfully is home again, and uh, James Ewing, and uh, David Gordon, and different other ones all on the list. Uh, there's a few others there as well. Uh, Dr. Lindsay Wilson was well prayed for, and we're thankful to the Lord for these individuals. But it was a blessed week, and all I can say to you is this, that we met with the Lord. We really did. We, we met with the Lord. And I can tell you the truth that I met with God, and that's, that's a fact. Uh, suppose we could put it the other way. The Lord met with us, and it was a blessed time, and we didn't want it to finish. And on the Friday, we always have the traditional time of praise, and uh, we finish about half past 12, and then we would just worship and finish off the day in praise. There's not a big lot of people left on Friday. Uh, most of them are way on home, and uh, so on and so on. And then some men change pulpit at the week of prayer, and I can understand that because it's a week, and if you don't get your sermons ready, then you're not going to get ready for uh, Sunday. But I was already prepared, and uh, it's been a habit of mine that I would just go to my own folks and my own church, and if the Lord blesses me, well, I will come with a blessing to you. And uh, I know as a lot of folks did say, that week of prayer has done you good. It's hard to know whether that's a compliment or not, because they say, what were you like before? <laughs> you need a full week to, to spend in the presence of the Lord. And uh, it was a blessed week. And I, I see it as a lifeline. I really do. As a lifeline to our denomination. And I see it as a lifeline to my ministry in Cumber. And without it, I would be the poorer, and so would you. But I want to tell you the work was brought to the Lord. God, I believe, was entreated. And he heard our prayer. And we placed the work in his hand. And he'll take us forward this year with his blessing upon us. That's just a little flavour of the week of prayer. We'll say farewell to our friends online. Thank you for listening. Pray the Lord will richly bless you. Folks, we'll get down to